Hi, my name is Asher Miller. I'm the uh, Executive Director of Close Carbon Institute, and uh, today I'm joined by Bill McKibben. Um, Bill is a, uh, an activist, environmentalist, and an author. He's, uh, in addition to being a Post Carbon Fellow, uh, author of 14, is it 14 books now, Bill? I think 14 books. I think something like that, 13 or 14. Okay, it's lost count. Um, he's a founder of 350.org, a scholar in residence at Middlebury College and top of doing a whole bunch of other things. Um, where are you these days, Bill? Where are you? I'm in Portland, Oregon. I'm on this kind of endless barnstorming trip for 350.org uh -huh. all over the country, then off to China and Australia in a few a couple of weeks. Got it. Okay. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk today. Um, you know, your latest book is, uh, is called Earth, uh, E-A-A-R-T-H. And, um, you have to say it more like you're uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger there. Oh, okay. Uh, is, that, is that good? <laughs> That's good. I, my, my Arnold impression is not good, even though he's my governor. Um, uh, you know, I, I got a chance to read Earth. I have to say it was a pretty sobering assessment, I think, of um, how we've changed this planet and, uh, and what the consequences are really from our, you know, dependence on fossil fuels. And I just wanted to ask um, – you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to live on a tough new planet? You, you know, the way you described it is uh, such that we had to kind of come up with a whole new name for it. So can you talk about, about what it means to live on, on this tough new sure. planet? Well, you know, I started uh, trying to raise the alarm about this a while ago. I wrote the first book about all of this 21 years ago, a book called The End of Nature. Uh, at the time, it was the early alarm about climate change, and a lot of people were sounding the same sort of alarm. And unfortunately, we didn't pay all that much heed. We haven't done all that much. And now it's no longer in the category of something that's going to happen if we don't take action. Now it's happening. Uh, uh, the air holds 5% more water vapor, which is why we're seeing these insane floods, deluges, downpours. The ocean is 30% more acid. If you look at the planet from outer space, it looks different because an awful lot of the Arctic has melted. We're seeing far more ferocious tropical storms, on and on and on. Um, so the book is an argument, A, that we need to figure out a new set of habits appropriate to this world on which we live. A lot of that means living smaller, more localized, decentralized lives. And two, that we need to step up this global fight to keep things from getting any worse than they absolutely have to get. And that means, in a sense, the opposite. It means figuring out how to do some real planet-scale organizing of the kind we've been trying to do at 350. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I first got engaged with, with uh, you know, climate activism just a couple of years ago, really, just a few years ago, you know, my experience was that people didn't really want to talk about adaptation. You know, it was sort of like uh, a word that people didn't want to acknowledge. Do you feel like that's changed, you know, in just the last few years? And we have no choice now but to be spending some of our energy on adapting because the world is shifting. Yeah. Uh, you know, the town where I live saw its two largest rainstorms in history about six months apart the summer before last. They washed out every road into town. The, the governor had to come visit on a helicopter. Well, we have to figure out how to adapt to that. We can't just keep doing the same thing anymore. Too expensive. And how, how do you think people within the climate you know, activist community are, are dealing with, with this? I mean, do you feel like this is sort of a shared recognition that, um, that as you said, we really change this planet in sort of um, inconceivable and irretrievable ways? I don't think that within the, the kind of environmental movement, People in any way are sort of giving up and saying, you know, all we're going to do now is figure out how to sure. react to the problem. I think we're spending most of our energy correctly still trying to figure out how to speed the transition away from fossil fuel and toward renewable energy, because that will keep this from getting even worse than it already is. Yeah. Uh, but I also think that nobody's kidding themselves. And you really notice that when you get off to the developing world, uh, places where People are already dying in large numbers where landscapes are shifting, where food's getting harder to grow, where sea level rise is an omnipresent reality. Um, um, nobody there is thinking that we're going to get out of this easily. Mm -hmm.
do. And you've talked about, I think you've made a pretty convincing case talking about how we need to work on two levels. One is in our own backyards and the other is really pushing our leaders to lead. Um, so when you, when you think of kind of the man and the woman on the street, you know, uh, young families, what is it that you tell them that is the best way that they can sort of get engaged and make a difference? So, you know, close to home, we need to think less about our individual selves and more about our communities, getting them in the kind of shape to be resilient and vulnerable, uh, not vulnerable. That means working on uh, local food systems, local energy systems. It means building up your farmer's market. It means all the kind of things that make a community a community. Because going forward, that connectedness is going to be a tremendous resource, more important really than access to any of the physical resources that we need. Um, but communities can't do this by themselves. And so people need to save part of their energy to join these big global scale campaigns that have some hope of, of actually changing the price of energy and hence hastening this transition. Uh, that's what we're working on at 350, and it's been amazing to watch people around the planet figure that out. When we had our uh, first big day of political action last October, uh, there were 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. Uh, foreign policy said it was the largest coordinated global rally of any kind on any issue in the planet's history. And most of the pictures of that day show people who are, you know, so families show black, brown, Asian, poor, and young people, or some combination, because that's what most of the world is composed of. Mm -hmm. We haven't won yet. I mean, we got 117 nations at Copenhagen to sign on, but they were the wrong 117 nations. So now we need to figure out uh, how to build up that pressure. This October, we're having a huge global work party on the 10th of October that will let people do things in their communities, put up solar panels, dig community gardens, and link them together in a way to send a pointed political message to our leaders. We're getting to work. What about you? you mm -hmm. know, if I can climb up on the roof with a hammer and put in a solar panel, you can climb up on the floor of the Senate and hammer out some legislation. So how do people get involved in that? Well, it couldn't be easier because we've got the superior, if I say so myself, website. <laughs> and if you go to 350.org, there's all the information you'll need and in a wide variety of languages, depending on what you speak. Uh, we'll knit you together with people in your area uh, who are already interested in the same thing. Good. And so last question for you. You know, you've been circling the globe a couple times now to get this message out and, you know, uh, working on this for 20 years. Um, you know, at this point, you know, what is it that's giving you hope? What's feeding you? What's keeping you going? Well, there are days when I'm not all that hopeful, I, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm, we're up against the strongest industrial enterprise there's ever been, uh, uh, the most profitable thing humans have ever done. So the Fossil fuel industry is not going to give up without a fight. Uh, but it's quite amazing to see people in every corner of the planet coming together around, you know, around an obscure scientific formula like 350 parts per million CO2, understanding that it's the most important number in the world. The scientists have said if we can't get back there, then we can't have a planet like the one we were born onto. To see that happening can't help but give you a certain amount of hope. Uh, I don't know if we're going to win, but I guarantee you we're going to fight. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, we're rooting for you. We're here. We're going to be part of the work party effort and um, and keep up the good fight. Okay, we're, we're so grateful to everybody at PCI and to the understanding that these uh, uh, that the battle about peak oil and about climate are exactly the same battle, yeah. uh, that we need to move quickly into this new world. Yeah, and like you say, I think um, – where I guess I find my hope is all the examples that are out there, you know, um, across this country and around the world of people taking this stuff into their own hands. You're right, it's not enough, you know, but uh, but it feels good to do. It's something, you know, and uh, it's amazing. It's amazing the kind of creativity that we see out there. So.